Okay, so actually it was a, a philosophical conference where I went and, and I realized I know so less about philosophy than, than the philosopher knows about computer science. So I'll be really learning in the meantime a lot because I think we really need to look to the things from different perspectives. And the previous talk was really uh, putting also uh, a lot of problematics that we need to, to, to somehow focus at when we uh, deal with new technology. So uh, what I'll talk about is actually about the, the change that is happening nowadays. And the change is first in the focus of the computing, actually. Normally, we use to use computers. Now the computers are using us. And this is the huge difference. And uh, I believe we are not ready for this. And we are neglecting that when we develop adaptive systems or autonomous systems, we actually forget that we are the species that, which are most adaptive in the universe, as far as we know. And uh, that maybe we are changing ourselves when using this technology we are, we are, we are producing. And I'm just asking the questions whether those changes are good or whether we are aware of those changes at all. So, uh, just I'll, I'll talk, to give you an outline, I'll talk about various application domains where I see those problems, and I'll take the rationale by design, which is the kind of the major idea in, 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 in my solution, so to say. And then I talk about human-centered systems, and then I introduce my real-life computing paradigm, which I believe may be a step in the right direction in dealing with this uh, uh, saving us <laughs> from the technology we are producing or imposing to us. And also, uh, there will be a, a kind of always a discourse on, on the ethical issues that I want to, to, to put on all the time, because I think that's something that we, especially we engineers, are forgetting constantly. We don't want to deal with this. It's too tricky for us. It's too unstable. So, uh, when we think about design, and there was always a wish, a human wish to, to make us better, to, to change us, and whenever we do some change, we think it's a good one. And the uh, uh, 1960s cartoon, uh, there was a, like a projection, what the tomorrow's men will look like. But it's not only 1960s, even in the, uh, and uh, sorry, if then you look what we are now doing, it's maybe difficult to read, but I can tell you, we, all, uh, we, we are having this technology, which was, you know, 50 years or a bit more like a, a dream. Nowadays we have it and we apply it. Maybe not nuclear power as a, as a bicycle <laughs> driver support, but all the other technology is here. Uh, also, uh, when we think about uh, how we can help uh, uh, people in medicine or how we can even redesign us a little bit, so there's a lot of progress in, in that as well. But if you look even further, 19, uh, 1837, Shelley Mary uh, wrote this famous uh, novel of Frankenstein. And then the man was developing something, but somehow, when, uh, and that's her message, when the man wants to play the god, changing the nature, changing everything, that can be dangerous for him. This is the uh, kind of warning that we got two centuries ago, and we should not forget it. Uh, nowadays, is the this, this year uh, cover uh, article, uh, not article, the, the journal of the uh, IEEE Information uh, Technology and Society Journal, which I recommend you very much. Just take this journal and, and see what the people write there. And uh, this journal is about uh, human augmentation. We are not satisfied with us. We want to change us. We want to improve us. And there is a lot of things that we can do with technology. And it's being done. But this, uh, this issue uh, thinks about ethical, ethical uh, concerns. What can we change? and whether these changes would provoke some other changes and whether it is good or not to do all this. So it's really something that we have to think about. So if you uh, uh, somehow uh, want to take something more seriously, is that even then, six, 60 years ago, uh, there was a question, is it really what we want? 
Do we really want all these changes? Can we make it differently? So simply, it needs to be considered and reconsidered again and again. And just what I mean by design, uh, because there was a famous uh, approach uh, when uh, Kowaki uh, actually uh, introduced this concept of privacy by design. And the major idea is that we develop systems, but we don't care about privacy. That if you want really to have privacy in the system, you have to think from the beginning. You have to, by design, make the system uh, protect privacy when the privacy is concerned. It's a very good concept, and uh, it's too long on. And I don't think that it's really ac accepted by the major uh, manufacturers, but it's a very good concept. And now, a human by design actually means uh, biological and psychological and human uh, being and has little to do with technology. Now, when we do human augmentation, we are actually mixing with this and we have to be aware of that. And I'll talk more about this later on. And what I want actually to introduce is to think about possible negative impacts and by design include this into our future systems. And this is my major idea here. And by design actually means inherently. If you want to have inherently safe system, then you have to think about safety from the beginning. And most of our present system, and I'll talk about this later, are, you know, they have some side effects. And side effects are usually not safe, privacy vulnerable, uh, error prone, and so on. So we have to develop or design our system better. So, in software engineering, you know, we know all about software design, and there are various models. And, uh, but somehow this agile methodology, extreme programming, is getting uh, very popular. And I think on these uh, techniques, are, are, where are the leaks also? Because we want to, and also the, the major companies, want to develop their software fast, want to put them on the market. And actually what we are doing for the last 50 years, and no one is complaining, we've been testing. Microsoft will be testing most of the, of, the, of the software, which is actually, we are buying software and then we are testing it on the run. And okay, that's fine, but once we put a man in the processing loop, it may be dangerous. And this is my point. So when we look to the uh, <coughs> IoT, IoT is really redesigning our environment. And uh, I mean, look to the previous talk and uh, things will be automatic, we have to change our habits, uh, we have to find a balance between uh, what is autonomous or how much we are autonomous. I mean, there's a lot of issue there, and I'm sure you're, you're exposed to this as well, and as you said, probably a mixture is the optimal version, not that you automate complete traffic, but maybe some parts, and, and then it may be really good. So, in this IoT, this is something that we really don't want to be, is just a thing. Because we are, uh, we needed to, be, to, to have, a, I mean, we as a, as a human being need to have a special role. After all, we develop all this for us. So I don't want to be just a thing, you know, connected there and then manipulated by, by the system. So if you look to the brain-computer interface, uh, it really it redesigns us, really. And, uh, Basically, what you have is that you are measuring, we have it on the, on the first talk yesterday, uh, you measure uh, the brain signals, then you extract certain features, then you can uh, diagnose some of the psychological or even pathological uh, human state, and then you expose the man to certain situation, computer controlled, and then you hope that this will be improved. So we have a very good application nowadays. We have a, a mind reader for, let's say, you can uh, type in without moving your hands, uh, just with thinking, okay, on this, this letter or this letter. We can change now or um, we can allow people with disabilities to, to somehow uh, turn their, their, uh, their, their, their chairs left and right just by, by their mind. We can uh, move prothesis nowadays. So there's a lot of advances there. And they are very good applications, actually. They are very good. This is one of the, of the really uh, very positive, uh, so to say, examples of what we are doing. But still, we have to be very careful there. Because 
Uh, we have a kind of functionality, which is usually the, the goal of, of, of the technology, uh, versus the nature, real nature. Because at the beginning, I remember when I was working in neural network area for maybe 15 years, and then there were some uh, efforts to connect uh, the artificial neural networks to the real neurons. And the major problem was uh, either you connect, you wire the neurons, and then you destroy the neurons, or the neurons would destroy the, the wires because the, the, of, of the some self uh, defended. So, so it's always a problem, uh, you know, when you really bridge the connection to the nature. Now we are at, 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 the, at the previous talk. Uh, we are also redesigning the autonomy. And uh, there is one thing that you didn't mention, but this, the, the major problem is that I want to take my car and I want to go somewhere and I enjoy driving. And it's really the opposite of what, what the autonomous traffic would, uh, would do. And now uh, we have to deal with this, simply. We have to deal. But we have to be aware that we have to give up a part of our autonomy if we have a good reason to have this. But just we have to be aware of this from the beginning. And uh, as long as we are not, it, uh, not ready to give up our own autonomy, we are not going to, to develop and use this kind of system. So there has to be a balance between uh, what we are doing and why we are doing this. Now also we are redesigning our behaviors, everyday behaviors. We are now, nowadays even putting these little things in our home and talking to it to get some things done or to, to uh, order something, and basically it is a kind of a shortcut of various things that we allow into our homes. Is it a trustworthy? Are there some other potential rings? No one knows. What is the actual business logic behind the company selling this? We think we know, but we don't care actually. At least those people who are buying this don't care. So we have to be really aware of intended, but also of unintended impacts. Sometimes the bad impacts uh, are not intended. I'm not saying that everyone wants really something bad, but sometimes we are just simply not aware of this. Or uh, social networks. It's really redesigning our society. It's completely redesigned our society. Really, I mean, when you, th there is a really a, a huge divide between people using social networks and people not using social networks. There two different words nowadays. So, but when you think those who, who somehow propose social networks, they would, this is one of the favorite uh, logic behind why it is good and so on, this SWOT analysis, what are the, the opportunities and threats and then strengths and weaknesses and what is good, what is bad. So I'll forget about this, but are we aware of the costs because somehow, I think the, the clever man, when, when you see that someone is giving something to you for free, there must be something wrong. So what are the costs of those systems? Really, what are the costs of those systems? Because what you get from free may turn out to be very expensive. And simply think about privacy leaks, security, addiction, attention, attention destruction, Exhibitionism. I mean, you name it, and there is there no balance. Back to go to the pr first talk. I'm not against it. It just has to be balanced. You have to know when to switch off something. Or you, it's really, I mean, it's changing us. And I don't know whether we are aware of this. And last but not least, something which I learned 10 years ago, and now I'm still catching up with them, is that we are really redesigning our our ontological perspectives, something that we are used to. It. Do you have you uh, do you have to do something with, with, with small kids? You know, you're, nowadays small kids are playing. The, the major toy is the smartphone, of course. Have you seen the two-year-old kid trying to enlarge the newspaper uh, image? I mean, this is what I'm talking about. There, there is a, a fundamental uh, difference, you know, because we are used to. I mean, the whole our civilization, philosophical thinking, is that. Objects and processes are something fixed that you can touch, you can feel, it is. But nowadays in information so, uh, <clears throat> domain, it's, processes are not physical. Objects are not physical. They are typified, they can be clonable. Or 
the right of usage is really much more important than the ownership. Now, uh, I was developing a concept for uh, e-vehicles, and the major thing that the, uh, uh, that the companies, at least in Germany, want to have is not to offer you to own e-car. It's just to offer you the service of using e-car, because the e-cars are good when they're shared. And most of these things are actually about coordination. That's something which was already also said. So, uh, you don't have to own things. But how many of us are really ready to, to discard our cars and have a service of a car? It's a tricky thing. And also the criterion of, of existence. Uh, it's really not so fixed as it used to be. Now, it is important to interact. As long as we can interact, we exist. So, it's really uh, a complete uh, change of perspective, and we have to deal with this. And uh, we have nowadays really uh, one group, which are, as the, uh, the famous uh, philosopher uh, Luca Floridi calls them, infogs or information organisms. And on another, we have uh, digital retards, <laughs> people who don't give a damn or don't know anything about. Uh, new technologies, they n n never hold the, the smartphone in their hand. And there are really two worlds. So what is better? And you can really discuss, there are certain advantages of one group also, of the other. And rarely uh, we really uh, think about this. So again, I want to stress this, uh, this magazine, uh, which is now uh, more than, uh, you see, from 1982. It's that has wonderful uh, contributions in these various domains of what is technology is doing to us. So I do recommend it to you uh, for somehow checking uh, up now and then our, our ethical principles. Because we are really, when we, rede when we redesign the nature, we are uh, coming into the paradox, often. Uh, simply, you know, uh, do you want to make something which is better than our brain? So our brain is going to do to make something which is better than our brain. I mean, it's, it's, it's unnatural. You would say it's impossible. Uh, computer scientists would say, okay, now we make neural networks, we, we make artificial intelligence, and we will mimic the, the real brain. And the, the uh, neuroscientists would say, we don't understand how it works. So now you explain me, are we, are, are we to be worried about this? I, I, I still think we don't have to be worried about this, but those are tricky things. Uh, and also, you can, uh, when we think about side effects, it's really sometimes they're anticipated and then we should be angry about this. But often they are not anticipated. So things can happen because we don't know. There are things that we know that we know, there are things that we don't know that we don't know. So those are the three, two extremes. And, uh, we have to somehow, when we develop the, the system that have a strong influence to us, we have to really think seriously about the possible uh, effects and side effects and put them into the design phase of our systems. Because nowadays we have systems which are running by certain goals. Any, you name it, social network, Facebook, Twitter, there is a goal behind our systems and they function according to these goals. And often those goals are commercial. So nothing against the commercial goals, but just we have to be aware of this. And we also have to be aware of the side effects. And then we, we will see what to do with this, because uh, again, I'm not against this. I only think it's very important that we are aware of what is going on. So, uh, especially when we talk about human central system, as I started, nowadays it's not just having a computer which does something. Now, the computers are dealing with us. And the computers are analyzing our own situation. And somehow they influence our behavior. And computers are working according to certain program. Don't forget that. So we have to be aware how this program is manipulating us. Or it doesn't have to be negative, the, the word manipulation, but that's what it's doing. Simply, we have to be aware of this, especially when the, we are in the, in the processing loop, when uh, to our body various sensors are attached. 
and then there is a logic which would then impose us to another situation and influencing us. I mean, diagnosing our, our states, maybe reading our minds a little bit. So, enhancing our communication capabilities, as the social networks definitely do, that's all fine, but simply uh, we have to be aware what is the business model behind, because most of those systems we get for free. Ooh, what it can do with us? This is always the question. Now, I'll, I can give you a few more uh, nice examples on the system I was working on, really, because those are, this is one, and those are the colleagues from INRIA in France. They developed these little toys, and uh, they uh, have a real-time picture of the sensors, which are the uh, FNIRS, uh, um, uh, shafts here, FNIS is the functional near infrared spectrography. Uh, maybe uh, a bit more serious devices on the first talk were shown with, uh, with functional uh, uh, with scanners. So here you, you, you got the oxygen flow in the certain part of the brains so that you can measure activities in the state of the, of the, of the kids. And those are kids. Uh, 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 this system is about anxiety. So when the kids are anxious, this doll will show their, in real time uh, the more red color here over the, uh, over the head. And as they're getting calm, and the system is measuring this, and in the real time changing the color here, the doll. And the, and the goal is that kids are playing with the dolls. And they are trying to somehow be uh, tender to them, and they, they try to calm down them, and they can also uh, move them a little bit. So uh, when they are nervous, then the doll is red, and it's like kicking and being really nervously uh, behaving. If they are trying to calm down them, and they really calm down themselves in the process, then the, the picture, uh, the, the color will change here and uh, the doll will be more quiet. And it really functions. And there's a lot of uh, uh, psychologists in, involved in this. And uh, this is called the neurofeedback. This is the system that really uh, does, that, that it does help kids somehow uh, overcome these nervous states. So, uh, and it's a real example of, of the system that really somehow influences the behavior those kind of systems I'm talking about. This is another example. I just go faster about this. This is about uh, light depression and, and how uh, you can cover this. And again, our system that we developed, uh, it's a mood player together with Philips. It's, uh, it's a music player that would uh, show you the music. And then if you like the music, the music will be louder. Or if you dance with the music, like, you know, I put my favorite one, then the music will be louder. If you are just still and you're not looking there, then the system will change the music. So it really, uh, with the music, it affects your, your mood. So those are the, some of the systems that I was really uh, working at. We, uh, we have a co-driver uh, support in the car. Uh, so, and then uh, we, we, we had an uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, e-vehicles, and uh, we developed uh, this kind of uh, robots which behave autonomously. So, so I'm really involved in this kind of, uh, of, of uh, uh, work. And why I'm mentioning this is that we have a software at our institute that control these kind of systems. And only when you really deal with the, with the source code, you can change it from the beginning. You can do something with it. And we, are, we, we do uh, practice on this. And we try to, to change something. So I'll just skip this one, because uh, I just want to go back a little bit again about the, the processing. Our computer is working normally, you know, uh, when it started uh, 50 years ago. You have input, you have process, you have output. and then. Now, uh, as, it's, uh, as the processing became uh, more uh, sophisticated, there was some feedback from the uh, output coming to the input, and we got some kind of loop. Then we have a, a user have a send, uh, typing on the keyboard, looking to the screen, and, and something was happening. And then uh, somehow screen is not anymore uh, so important. Now we have a person with various sensors, and uh, only implicit commands. Uh, you're not saying anything to computer. Computer understands what you think. 
computer understands what you feel, and it goes on. So we are getting a kind of adaptive control, and we call this biocybernetic loop. When you have all these sensors and the, and the, and the actuators and the processing, so. In the case of, because I did a lot of uh, neuroprocessing, uh, we call it neurocybernetic loop, because you have a special kind of diagnosis meant for the mental states. So, uh, what are the software challenges there? Uh, we want to regulate high level, uh, often vital, uh, for example, cognitive functions in us with adaptive closed loop control. And we want to have a uh, Timely computing, we want to have side effect free computing, and we want to have a correct functioning. So, we really used to need formal methods. We used to think we, ha we have to define also a dangerous situation, and we have to take care about this. And also, we have to have a kind of respectful treatment about uh, you, you know, certain personal information. Because when you see nowadays what has been done with our data, it's disastrous. And it will continue for a certain time, but not for too long, I can tell you, because the people will now then uh, start to protect themselves from all this uh, information abuse that we have nowadays. So with the real-life computing paradigm, uh, uh, we try, or I try to, to somehow introduce social responsibility into the software engineering. Because, you know, uh, when uh, we develop the real-time systems, then we need uh, experts from the certain field and uh, the real-time systems usually control certain uh, physical phenomenon. And uh, you can't uh, develop this if it is for the water system, then you need a water specialist. If it is for the electric electrical system, you need the electrical specialist. But when we develop the, the neural systems, we are not even asking the, the others. We just think we are engineers, we can do it. Or when we make a social networks, tell me how many uh, social scientists were involved when the, when the Facebook was developed. And uh, how many of the social scientists are involved nowadays in, in the reasoning about this? It's amazing how little. It's amazing, really. So we have to put a lot of constraints there and we have to uh, check them in the runtime. This is something which is not being done nowadays. Uh, in, uh, even in medical systems, you know, when you have to somehow in the loop, measure certain parameters in the body and then give some maybe uh, medicine. At the beginning, the, you know, the engineers is a typical, our thinking is now, there is, a, for example, for, for artificial pancreas, is you know, the people with diabetes. Now, now we measure the low sugar in the, in, the, in, the, in the body and then we pump the insulin if it is too high. And then we see, okay, the sugar is too low. It's too low, then we pump the sugar in it to make the balance. And you can do it all the time, and, 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 and the organism will be ruined after, after, after half an hour, because there is an inertia in the body. It takes some time to, to be balanced, and we have to develop systems who are sensitive to this inertia that we have. Also with this system that deal with our mental states. It's not like you, I give you something and, and, and you're now <laughs> in, in a very good mood. It needs time. And we have to produce the system that take care about this. So in our real-life computing, we, we define real-life constraints as, as a certain situation uh, that you want to take care about. Uh, and that may de uh, depend on the application, because de depending what your, uh, what your application is dealing with, then you have to somehow grasp the social and individual context and try to put it in your software, and from the beginning, then we believe you're better. So, uh, we also want to have autonomous system, because only autonomously, aut autonomous systems for me means adaptive system, adaptive all the time, and it has to be adaptive itself, it, in the terms that it has to improve itself. So, to make these kind of systems, we need to uh, collect the knowledge about the environment, and uh, in the case of real-life computing, those are those real-life constraints that we want to somehow know in advance, or at least have a definition of them from the beginning. And then in our bio-cybernetic loop, which is always looping, thinking uh, or, or diagnosing us and taking into account 
uh, our state and checking whether all our important states are okay. Do we have to follow our business goal or we have to take care about the man? Because one little example, we also had a, a system, we developed a system that was uh, directing uh, the, the computer game according to the, uh, how skillful the, the player is. It was with EG signals, uh, uh, looking to the uh, effort and, and the concentration of, of the player. And if you're very good, you get to the higher level. But with this system, you can exhaust the pure crazy guy who is very good in computer gaming, but he doesn't care about himself. So it, it, it will be exhausted. So you have to have a kind of uh, checking uh, of his mental state and, and say, now you make a pause. Stop, stop playing. So now I will think I'll, I'll just put it in another gear <laughs> and I'll give you a, a short uh, uh, programming uh, uh, skeleton of what we did. So, so you usually have a number of loops going in separate threads, you know, doing some checking certain uh, uh, physiological states and then uh, getting some, some, some mental states and then doing something. But then you have the checkout of the constraints and you do it in parallel. It's a separate from the programming logic. So it's like exception handling, actually. This is the, the idea behind. And as the exception handling would, uh, would handle the certain exceptions that happen in the, in the code, so will our real life guards somehow grasp some bad situation and react on this. So actually, we need to formally specify conditions to be protected. We have to develop these real life guards. We have to make continuous monitoring and automatic recovery. Okay, this is, uh, I can send you my, my paper. For th there are some examples here how, how, how we do it in, 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 a, in a more complex biocybernetic loops when we have different states. And uh, I just want to now uh, shortly about the privacy, how we can develop different uh, types of, of privacy and how to take care about them. So basically, uh, what I want to say in, in the conclusion is that we have mostly business-oriented systems, and they are business-oriented by design, because they know what they, uh, what they are doing, and it's all fine. I'm not against them. We just have to be aware of this. And then we have to be aware that all this insecurity and un unsafety is a side effect, because they, when developed the system, they didn't care about these issues. Don't tell me that you can't make a secure system. You can, but you have to start from the beginning. It's more expensive. So is privacy vulnerable as a side effect? Is socially unaware by design? They don't care about this. And it's also psychophysiologically incomplete. It has to be involved. So actually the same message as from the previous talk. We need a multidisciplinary uh, consortia when we are developing those kind of systems. So we have to start to think about the system, from, uh, from, of the, all the problems from the beginning. So just a final comment, uh, when we look on the impact scale, you know, we measure the impact. I would say the medical systems are now that something that we can be really proud of. We really can help a lot of people by doing something with these kind of systems, and medical assistance is perfect. We should continue in this field, definitely. When we are not so good is in IoT. IoT, uh, the problem with IoT is the following. Now, nowadays we have a lot of little gadgets which are on the, on the internet and it's really miserably programmed. So we need more safety there, we need better care, uh, care there. And it's really, it's, it's good to, to, to have uh, humanities uh, in, the design, uh, in, in, in the design team. Okay, so uh, scientists think, engineers make. It's always a problem. When you make something, it's, it's uh, under the, the possible uh, uh, negative uh, uh, judgment. So we need really multidisciplinary teams. And uh, what I actually, yeah, it's, uh, we can talk some other time, really. It's about uh, really uh, how, what, what have science fiction to do with, uh, with, with the testing? The security testing, I can tell you some other time. Okay. It's, a, it's, it's, it's a huge, really uh, huge uh, 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 overlapping. And uh, about further work, I'll tell you some other time. How can we social 
uh, theories, how we can put social theories in social networks. We have very good ideas there. And the major problem is how to make a sustainable IoT system. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you have to be able to continue without electricity. Yes. Then you have uh, sustainable systems. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much.